Hello and welcome to 10 Very Big Books, a Malazan read-through podcast. My name is Peter Bond and I've read every book in the main series. However, my co-host during the series for the first time with me today is my friend and closest confidant, India Jones. Hello! And our producer, AJ Filari, is with us. How are the levels? How are the bars? The bars are looking great. The levels are super close together because you were speaking so fast. <laughs> and rounding out the crew is Joshua Baker. How are you, my friend? Uh, I'm doing fine. It's hot in my apartment, so I'm very sweaty. But that's about it. Did, didn't you nice. just put on a sweatshirt? I did just put on a sweater because I was cold, but now I'm hot, and that's where we are with <laughs> And, of course, with us today, returning for uh, an interview at the end of House of Chains, is Steven Erickson, friend of the show. How are you today, Steve? <laughs> oh, I'm not too bad. Not too it's bad. It's a fair day. Has it gotten chilly yet? No. Nope. In Canada? No, not in the West Coast. Mm. Uh, we're excited to have Steve back on the show, and since we just finished our rethrows House of Chains, we're going to work through some questions, talk about the book, and talk about how everyone's doing. Okay, I'd like now, to start. Ooh. Kick it off, Steve. Oh, my goodness. Out the gate. Yeah. the curveball. Uh, especially listening to your last podcast. I think, uh, Peter, you're the only uh, rereader of the series that I've ever heard who likes the book even less the second time around. <laughs> um, usually, it's, it's the opposite. And so I'm a little bit curious as to your take on not just House of Chains, but sort of some of the themes I'm exploring starting with Gardens of the Moon running all the way through um, Dead House Gates, uh, Memories of Ice, and now House of Chains. So I just thought I would, you know, apply some Socratic, Socratic inquiry here and, um, and just sort of try to work out what it is that you found so objectionable about House of Chains. So can you tell me what are some of the um, thematic elements uh, that I've been exploring in the first four books? Hmm. You are, you're so, being tested here, so just so you know. <laughs> I've never seen him put so on the spot. Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll directly respond to your question. But first, let me say, I think I had a similar experience. Read, hmm, let me how to, how to phrase it. I think the first time I read House of Chains 2, I kind of bounced off the book and it wasn't really for me. Um, but so I, I kind of knew that coming into this one. And I was interested to see how it, I would kind of reevaluate it as I did with Gardens of the Moon. And I think this whole time rereading these books, the things that I think I chafe against in the books, I, I think I come to an understanding why more that these uh, I'm bothered by these things or that they don't work for me. Mm -hmm. And then the things I really love about the books, I come to a deeper understanding of like why I think they are really clever or right, why they really resonate with me. Do you know I mean? So I think altogether, rereading this book, I came to a greater understanding of what frustrates me about it mm -hmm. and also what I came to really appreciate about the book. So I think, sorry, I guess that was just a bigger thought, but to connect it directly to your question. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I, oh. yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think there's a lot of different things being discussed across it, but I don't know. I uh, hmm. Yeah, I, I guess I would struggle to articulate an answer because I think House of Chains is exploring the, the themes in House of Chains, I would say, are not different than the other ones because they're a part of it. But I do feel like it's there's a thematic through line that's kind of open and resolved in this book that isn't necessarily open and resolved within Gardens of the Moon, which I think has some uh, different thematic through lines unique to that book. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I guess that's I don't know. If I were to bring up the subject of colonialism, would that be sure. something you would recognize not just in House of Chains, but in the entire series to date? Yeah, of course. I, I think that's, you know, obviously you're writing about empire. It's, it's a through line throughout it. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Do you think I'm approaching colonialism um, from the position of good versus evil? No, I don't think you're really trying to cast it in a moral light necessarily, because I think it's just, I don't know. I don't think good versus evil is really a framing often in the books like that. But but the subject of colonialism often is, isn't it? Yeah, which which I think um, it's tough. I think in a, in, which, you know, it's understandable, you know, colonialism, it, it, 
it is a pretty bad thing, you know? So I understand reducing it down to it being a moral evil, you know? Mm -hmm. I understand going there. Um, but... Okay, so when you think of colonialism, presumably you're thinking no. primarily of uh, the age of exploration uh, coming out of Europe in the 15th and 16th centuries. Would that be accurate? I would say I think about that time period, and I also think about the colonization of Africa primarily. They're yeah, two, so I would later say on into the 17th and 18th centuries. Then. Yeah, definitely. Right. So do you hold to the same negative notions regarding that colonialism as you would to, say, the Greeks colonizing the Mediterranean in, in the 4th century, 5th century, 6th century B.C.? Yeah, I think I know less about the colonization done by the Greek and Roman Empire. So I think definitely when I think about colonization, I am more referencing the those colonizing efforts by yeah. the Europeans. Yeah, so what we bring to these books is that sensibility. It's the post-colonial reevaluation of colonialism as expressed in the European diaspora of uh, the 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th centuries. Um, I, I'd say that's a fair, a fair statement. Um, I think one of the points my novels are trying to make is colonialism has a much longer history and things are not yeah. quite um, as cut and dried as uh, the European uh, approach to colonialism. And we have had colonialism throughout most of human history. I mean, North America was colonized by you know, the first Asians to come across or Europeans, we're not sure which, but um, and that could have been 30,000 years ago. And then with that initial colonization, there were subsequent waves of colonizations that genetically replaced the previous populations. So if you want to sort of apply that sort of good evil kind of notion, it runs all the way through history. Uh, would that sound like a, a fair assessment? Well, I'm not an expert on the subject, but I would say my first thought is that there's isn't there a difference between empires kind of purposefully colonizing something and, and an expansion in a different sense? I guess that's my mm -hmm. my, my thought, you know, because I, th I think especially if you look at something about what England did mm -hmm. during that colonial era, I think there's a real distinction to be made there between that imp a, a, a colonial effort and a colonial ideology as opposed to. 30,000 years ago, yeah, an expansion okay. of people. But what about um, the Roman Empire, for example? Yeah, I, I think that's probably more more in courting with an imperial colonialist outlook, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah. as I said, I don't know that much about the Roman Empire's philosophy when it came to colonizing the Mediterranean. It was a lot like what the Malazan uh, philosophy is, and that, that was kind of the inspiration for what we were talking about. But both Cam and I recognize that Colonialism is not a simple issue. It's, it's a very complex issue. And if you come at it from an anthropological point of view, it gets even more complex. So um, what I'm leading towards is going to the scenes regarding Bidithal's creation of her, his cult that, sure. that was centered upon uh, an effort on his part to entrench a belief system that led to uh, female circumcision. Correct. Yeah. yeah. All yeah. right. Now... What happens with a lot of post-colonial thinking is we look at a, another culture, uh, a different culture, um, one not con you know commonly defined as Western culture. And in anthropology, there was a, a long, long period when I was studying it of, it may still be going on, I don't know, of hand-wringing regarding um, attitudes, Western attitudes brought towards um, traditional practices of other cultures. Yeah. And of course, one has to recognize historically that anthropology is a colonial creation. Uh, the entire discipline mm. was all about sort of rational, enlightened individuals plunging themselves into um, foreign, quote, primitive, unquote, cultures um, and observing clinically and in an attached fashion practices of those cultures and then going back and writing in and becoming professors and, and lecturing on them. So uh, in that context... I know you took great exception to the writing and the descriptions of Bidithal's uh, cult. Um, and what I sensed out of that was, I would almost call it a, a colonial perspective, in a sense. You didn't want to see it, and you didn't want to have to experience uh, the details of that. And I found that very interesting. Um, 
and I'm not suggesting that I'm presenting a thesis here. What I'm doing in the novel is, and what I was doing for the first four books at least, was exploring uh, the complexity of colonialism as it relates to uh, a major subject in anthropology, which is moral relativism. And in moral relativism, the notion is if a culture is seen to be practicing something that is traditional and self-defining for that culture, you step back, wash your hands of it, and say, not my problem. And with House of Chains, what it took was a civilization that had been conquered and then reestablished uh, at least some definition of freedom uh, or um, sovereignty uh, away from the empire, which allowed um, certain possibly old practices, at least cultures that allowed the creation of cults, no matter how twisted, to actually find root and to take place and to begin to manifest itself. So, you know, if, if I'm looking at what inspired me, it was it was um, the British uh, problems in India with the mutiny um, and various things that followed on from that. So that's kind of the context for what I'm looking at. And I know I, I find, you know, when people go, well, I, I didn't want to read that. I didn't want to see that. Well, fair enough. But nothing I describe in my novels comes close to reality. The real world is a lot messier and uglier than than that. And so the notion that I should be avoiding certain subjects really gets my back up. And that's one of the things I was hearing a fair bit um, as a kind of subtext uh, to certain subjects that I would explore in the novel. And so I'm, I'm still quite a, kind of curious that, you see, I don't agree with cultural relativism. I, I argued against it all through my anthropology. I think you have to draw a line somewhere. And certainly for me, the subject of female circumcision was certainly a place I would draw the line. Uh, whether a culture practices it or not, um, there's a good reason for fighting against it and uh, speaking out against it, uh, regardless of where we come from. So that is kind of the framework that sits around all this. Now there's a whole other side of things, and that is structural. I had a sense that most of you felt that House of Chains kind of left a lot of uh, threads dangling, uh, just sort of floating around out there. But if you think of the first three books and the order I ended up using, Dead House Gates and Memories of Ice, they run in, in tandem. They're in parallel with each other. And because of that, I, when I finished Memories of Ice, um, I put Duiker in the, in the bar in Darushistan and oh. had him say, now I'll tell you about the chain of dogs. So yeah. in a sense, the first three books are a closed loop. They're a Mobius loop. And, yeah. But here I'm faced with the, with the structural challenge of, well, okay, what am I going to do for the fourth book? Um, I've already now retired the bridge burners. Uh, they've basically been scattered. But I've got six more books to write. And so I needed to create a book that was going to set the stage for everything that was going to follow. So I could not tie up those threads. And so that's when Carcer just rides off. I mean, I cannot tie mm. these up. I have to leave them dangling. Um, mm. Secondly, I had to create our new version of the Bone Hunters, and I wanted to create them from scratch, and that, or, or rather the Bridge Burners, because I retired the previous group. Um, and when we first saw them in Gardens of the Moon, they were pre-established, and we got a flashback to their creation, which occurred in Reriku, in the desert, the Holy Desert, of course, um, in Memories of Ice. So there's timeline jumps that I'm playing around with here to link the first three books to everything else. So... When I wanted to create the Bone Hunters, which is coming, that is Tavor's army. For those of you who don't know, that may be a spoiler for you, but that's the name they acquire, is the Bone Hunters. So for them, I wanted you, as a reader, to see them from day one and see their development and how they form and how they come together and how they self-define themselves, where else but in Reriku. So it's a kind of a, again, there's a loop going on uh, for the creation of, of uh, these major military forces. So that was part of what uh, I had to do in the fourth book. Then I wanted to further tie us back to the third, the first three books, especially Dead House Gates, by jumping back in time and bringing Karsa all the way up to the point where we kind of meet him in Gardens of, or in Dead House Gates, and then continuing on from there uh, into the story that's going to go ahead in House of Chains. So this is kind of how I kind of structurally sewed those first four books together to leading up to the halfway point of the series where you're about to, I don't know if you guys started Midnight Tides yet. 
Uh, we're starting next week. We're starting next week. And that is, that is you know, that's the fulcrum point. Um, and so that is the last major setting shift that we're going to have in the series. So that's kind of like um, what I was laying out structurally. And this is why House of Chains is, unlike the first three books, which in that Mobius loop, there, there's a thematic closing of things. Uh, House of Chains is everything breaking wide open. It could just go straight out. And that's how it had to end, and which is probably why um, a lot of people feel that it's a very much a transitional novel between the first three books, which could almost stand as a trilogy, and the rest of the series. Mm-hmm. I had to link them all up. And then the final thing was with Gardens of the Moon and Dead House Gates and Memories of Ice, I was ramping up the endings, ramping them up and ramping them up. Mm-hmm. By the time I got, I mean, Memories of Ice was a freaking handful for me to write. It was a monster to write. And I realized that I can't keep pushing it up. I can't, I can't keep trying to ramp it up and not ramp it up over and over again with each book because I'm going to be able to write myself out of my ability to actually pull that off. Mm-hmm. So what I decided with House of Chains was to invert the entire process. So instead of ramping up, we are actually just closing right down to two people fighting on a battlefield as opposed to the moon riding, rising out of the water and a city being smashed and <laughs> telling mass everywhere. Right. Everything reduces down to these two, these two primary characters. And I'll stop and rest my voice now. So <laughs> a lot to respond to there. And let me just say I made a few notes. First, um, <laughs> it, it, it's interesting context you talk about for how you approached writing the Bidithal storyline. And it's probably worthwhile for us to loop back around to the subject because obviously our show talked about it a good deal. It, yeah, you did. Um, and... Uh, it's furthermore interesting your t- your discussion about colonialism and your perspective on it, and um, you know it's certainly a massive subject, and it's interesting for you to talk about its relationship to you thinking about moral relativism in the field of anthropology. And I guess for me personally, you know, it's a, it is a morally complicated issue, and it's a very serious issue. You know, it's a morally complicated issue, and I am made uncomfortable by it. Do you know what I mean? and uncomfortable by how the empire colonizes and explores these things which is you know which is perfectly fine it's very purposeful you know because as you said i don't really think the empire comes out see like i would never say the book endorses the empire no. you know it's 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 not very generous with the malazan empire but i wouldn't necessarily say it condemns the empire either you know no. it kind of portrays it in a more complicated way and probably that portrayal is what ultimately leaves me feeling uncomfortable, you know, which I'm sure is not that surprising of a feeling for you to hear. No. Mm-hmm. And then my final point I was going to make in response was about you're talking about the structure and it being a transitional book, which I think is very accurate. And when we talked about Memories of Ice, I noted that I felt that Memories of Ice in some ways has a very traditional structure and is a very traditional book. And when we were all enjoying the satisfying finale, I kind of knew that like, yes, of course, we all enjoyed this. You know, this is this, this, this. But I kind of knew since I had read the rest of the series that this was kind of an outlier in a way that more of the series is structured around kind of a more unconventional and stranger shape to a novel than Memories of Ice has. So coming into House of Chains, I was actually kind of keen to have us tackle, for lack of a better word, a kind of more Malazani book in a way, you know? Mm. And I think I'm more keen going forward to discuss these books that have weirder and weirder... It makes it sound like it gets out of control, but it's not really how I feel. But different and more unconventional structures, because I think you're accurate with how you're talking about how House of Chains has to link between these different things in this whole series and how its approach to how to structure and tell a story is very different than the other three books. So, whew, a Man, lot. Of, a uh, lot. I, I really hope the episode we recorded this morning comes out first because you answered every question that we pose in it. You have just yeah. really knocked out of there. <laughs> I'm just going to say, I try very hard not to Google things. I had to Google, about I had to Google cultural relativism just then. Like, um, <laughs> and I did too. I actually did Thank too. Thank goodness. Um, but when I know that we're going to be speaking, I secretly Google you and don't tell anyone. Um, just to find out, um, just some information so that when, when we, when we talk, I, I feel a little bit more, you know, in the know. And right before you said this, I, I read that the three, the first three books could stand on their own and 
this is this a setup. And then and then I was like, wow, how did I not realize that? Yeah. Like, it, it's actually kind of clear when you when you read it. So now I feel a little bit silly. <laughs> um, but well, I, there, yeah, there's I, a, some there's a, a repetition is occurring. Right. Because if we if we can think of the bridge burners and how they were formed in Raraku and what's happening now with this book is the bone hunters are being formed in Raraku. And so we're going to follow mm-hmm. them from start to finish this time, uh, whereas we only got the tail end of the bridge burners. So it, it, there is a kind of an overlap there for sure. I do. I really like your explanation of the structure. I was, I was we were talking about to that today in our episode recorded this morning about how my thoughts on it were that. Gar- I, I, we were we were discussing which books we felt were felt the strongest, and I put Gardens of the Moon above House of Chains specifically because I felt Gardens of the Moon had a better, more come together y ending. Yeah. And now I feel like I just missed. I feel like I've shown up to do a book report and hadn't read the book, but I did read the book. I just fundamentally misunderstood the entire thing. Yeah. Well, well, consider it this way. Uh, we'll go back to the Bidithal, Bidithal thing because this is really important because. There's a scene coming in a much later book that is, if anything, ten times more horrific than what you just got. Oh, we've yeah, we but someone <laughs> we, we know what it's called. We don't know what yeah. it is. Yeah, though. there's people have been alluding to it. Yeah. Okay. So imagine this. Uh, okay, you guys and I heard. I remember when you were discussing it, being a, a bit put off by the fact that it was Carsa who comes back into the camp and becomes this instrument of destruction for all the mechanic. All the, all the crap that's going on in that camp, which is kind of a, a microcosm of Seven Cities itself, uh, the continent mm-hmm. and its culture. Uh, he just comes in and he just slams and shuts it all down. And then he delivers a very symbolically pointed means of killing Bidithal. Mm-hmm. Within the context of colonialism, what do you think would have happened if I had the Malazans kill Bidithal? Well, I agree. That's a, a, a worse subtext in a way. Uh, well, oh, huh. is it ever? Well, huh, Steve? There was nobody else. There was nobody else who could do it. Yeah. Um, the second thing is for the Malazan universe. Um, by this point, you know, I'd written these four books, and it's it, it, it's a series that was not going to have sexism in any form. Um, so people who acquire power um, can shut down these kind of artificial constructs that are very prevalent in our world. And so I needed something to nail that down very, very specifically to say that if some ridiculous, insane cult like this rises up in the Malazan world, it has its own built-in mechanisms mechanisms to shut it down. And that's why mm. I put the decision-making process on that upon the most morally questionable character imaginable, which is Carso Orlog. Given mm-hmm. where he well, came from, um, he is. I mean, he's, he's morally dubious. But he, he is the most ambivalent of all the characters. And so when I was trying to decide, well, who's going to come in and shut down all this crap in, in Raraku? It has to be mm-hmm. Carson. It has yep. to be Carson. And mm-hmm. how would he do it? Well, he would do it in the most pointed fashion possible. So I wanted to jump in because you were talking about how you constructed this world without sexism and, and, and these artificial constructs in it. And I, I suppose I have this long thought about these books and I, I guess I wanted to maybe question you about or, or, or just push you on in a way in that, you know, there the, it is a world without patriarchy in a way, mm-hmm. right? And there is there I still think there's a lot of allusions to gender expectations from our modern world, mm-hmm. you know? And I'm curious about where that comes from and how that is established in the setting about the expectations that would be placed on men and women and they're different. And to quote a specific example, in, in House of Chains at the start of one chapter, you know, Absalar says, just because I'm a woman, all woman, it doesn't mean I can cook, you know? Which is clearly an allusion to some expectations placed on modern women, right? And, and but I'm curious about if that if that those expectations are the same in in the world. Obviously, it would seem like they would be different. But I don't really I don't really feel like I have the information as a reader to understand the context of gender expectations put on these different characters. Yeah, um, one of the things I was discovering was uh, with the first three books, nobody noticed that it was a sexist, uh, free world, even though. You had women in positions of, of immense power. In fact, you know, the Empress uh, is, is the prime mm-hmm. example there. But many others, Tattersail, um, and as you're going to discover, Tavor, huge positions of, of, uh, of power, and then also magical power and all the rest. So 
it's it's all there it's all there in front of you and and nowhere do you get the notion that women can't be soldiers for example i mean it, it's in other words mm-hmm. it's all laid out but nobody noticed and i think there was probably an element of frustration on my part that you know haven't you noticed this yet <laughs> it's very different from your classic fantasy setting that draws from a medieval or a eurocentric medieval kind of social structure where you've got nobles and knights and you've got maidens and you've got you know the daughters all have to be married off to powerful princes and all the rest um this is quite consciously screaming and shouting against that kind of expectation within the fantasy genre because once you carry that that across you've carried patriarchy right across with you and the whole thing about a fantasy world is you can create anything in that fantasy world so why not you know strip away the, these these assumptions uh, from our world um, and then find a mechanism that actually can rationalize and justify that you've stripped away those assumptions and just run with it. I guess where I end up confused then is because although there you've stripped away the power structure, like in scenes like that, Absalar is still alluding to the idea that she would that there is an expectation that she would be better at cooking than a man. And I wonder where that comes from in the world, you know? Like, well, what expectations are placed on men and women in different cultures, you know? Well, that's just it. It's that cultures across the board, at least on, in our world, they divide uh, labor in particular ways. Um, whether she said it, I, I don't know the context of it, but I suspect I was being tongue-in-cheek when I was doing it. Every now and then, I have to actually comment on our world, and I'll do it in, in a setting, and hopefully it slips past and nobody notices, but in your case, you noticed. So Yeah, it seems, it, it seems to me more directly that you're appealing to our world and our ideas of gender I'm, than I'm playing, really I'm the setting with, itself. with the reader expectation, yeah. yeah. So this is all good stuff. Um, but we <laughs> yeah, definitely we can cut, we got can cut the interview. Here. Started the Stop interview that. off with a bang, you know, I'll say that. And <laughs> it's funny because my first question we were going to ask, we had talked about it, and I thought it was going to be a good way to frame this whole thing, is to say that I think it's fair to characterize your work as divisive at times. And I think you've certainly garnered a fair bit of criticism in people who don't like your style of writing or your approach. And and obviously on this show, we've talked about different, you know, our criticisms, but I wonder how you've dealt with that now and how you've dealt with it throughout your career and approached critiques of your work. Um, is there is there an outside context to this? Is this in relation to uh, a recent essay I wrote that? Oh, well, that well, essay was sick. For, for the record, we all had read the we all have yeah. read that essay and <laughs> talked about it. Yeah. But honestly, it more came from I think we knew that. This was a book I think we were more critically engaged with than Memories of Ice. And we had a, we, we, we kind of were working through our feelings on that. And we figured what would be a good way to approach this. And I thought it would be good to talk to you about, I don't know, different ways you've you've dealt with that and engaged with criticisms in your life. Because I'm sure you've had plenty of people. Yeah. Uh, at your well, books. This is, sure. I'm sure this is nothing new from us, you know. No, and it's one of the things I, d- I discovered pretty early on was... Um, there is a site called the Malazan Empire.com. Um, Great website. Yeah. But I was noticing a trend by the time I got to the fourth book, which was, believe it or not, and you may not imagine it now, but I would get negative responses on the first read for mm. all three books, and then especially for House of Chains. So in other words, people didn't like it. So they didn't like Dead House Gates. Well, they didn't like Gardens because, it, well, lots of reasons. Uh, dropped in the middle of something, et cetera, et cetera. They didn't like Dead House Gates because it switched settings so so dramatically and only dragged a couple characters in. Um, found Memories of Ice to be bloated, hated the MIBE storyline, blah, blah, blah. Right? So, I don't get, I don't yeah, get that. The thing is, so I was noticing a trend, and the, the trend would be six months later on the site, those same people would come back and say, well, you know, I reread that. That's one of my favorite books. So <laughs> it, it would like they would – go from one star to five star and it seemed to be an ongoing process with each book and so i just had to sort of sit back and think well you know uh whatever i guess i'm gonna have to get used to this Mm. and it happened with midnight tides because again change of setting different characters bone hunters is actually two novels jammed structurally into one yeah told the hounds yeah people hated the the voice you know, and, and on and on and on. I think for me, what you just said really resonated with Toll the Hounds. I think a book that so radically changed 
from my first read to sure. my second read i like that my it's 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 my favorite book of them now and it's because of my second read i found it to be such a meaningful book but i think the first time i had a very different experience reading that book yeah and, and a lot of people uh do and so i've had to take the long view and um i've had to extend that much further because forge of darkness and fall of light the carcanus trilogy still has a, a, a very minor uh element who are engaged in that in that series, um, and mm. it's been years, you know, ten years for Forge of Darkness. So, one has to take the long view on these things. But at the same time, um, it can be pretty hard to sort of pull yourself back up to start on the next book if you've been, you know, absolutely hammered for the last the previous one. And that does wear a person down eventually. There's no question about it. It's probably why I've held off on the third Carcanus book until right now, which I'm working on it now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's rough. It's um, but it 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 comes with the territory. You know, I write to an imagined uh, audience, but it's actually not really an imagined audience. I write I write novels to entertain Cam. Cam writes novels to entertain me, and you know, everyone yeah. else is just sort of incidental to the whole issue. And we've just been <laughs> lucky that other people have come on board and, and enjoyed the books. But um, mm-hmm. in, in in a sense, we're writing the same way we gamed. I would run a game to entertain Cam on that game session night and then the next night he would run a game to entertain me so <laughs> what a loving friendship yeah it's been a great friendship. <laughs> seriously yeah. it's beautiful and so now we just mm-hmm. do it at, you know at a distance because i see if i'm lucky i see cam once a year but generally mm. i don't even see him that often so yeah, huh. yeah. okay i have a mm. question <laughs> you said that you've seen like a trend of people reading the book having their grievances reading it again and saying oh my god i love it what was i thinking why do you think that is what what changes between the first read and the second read that and even Peter Peter says it all the time like oh I read this the first time and I what I, it was it was good and I liked it but I read it the second time and I loved it um so is it just maybe that they they've they've read through it and they know now and then they're picking things up the second yeah. time or do you think it's more than that because it's it you have a cult following yeah. <laughs> so like people love these books and. For I mean, good reason, but I just don't get how they can go from such intense emotions. Yeah, I mentioned this in in my earlier discussion with with another person who's, Damn who's it. yeah who's blogging. But so I'm trying to be I unique know, so here. <laughs> I'm going to be very brief, but I foreshadowed in such a way that those foreshadowing elements don't get noticed the first time round, and they will get noticed the second or third time round. Mm-hmm. Do you kind of think to yourself like idiots? No. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> No, no, no. no. Uh, it, I want a uh, long shelf life for these books. I want people to be able to come back to them. And I've experienced the opposite where there are, you know, I, I grew up reading Edgar S. Burroughs, for example. I ended up buying every reissue of, of, of his books. You know, I'm 12 years old, 13, whatever. And to this day, there's only two of them I can read and, and still enjoy. And that's Tarzan of the Apes, the first book, and um, A Princess of Mars. Uh, the rest are, are virtually unreadable. <laughs> and that is so disappointing. It, it, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's where our nostalgia was born. It's where our, you know, for me anyways, my love of, of fantasy fiction, adventure fiction was, you know, took form. And so I still have those books. I mean, I still have the pocketbooks and I'll never get rid of them. But man, I can't read them now. So I really had in mind that if if I want this series to stand the test of time, uh, it has to survive rereadability. Um, it mm-hmm. can't date itself. I mean, there's only so much within an author's control, uh, idioms and, and style of uh, speech, that kind of thing. But by and large, um, the longer I can I can have these books on people's shelves, the happier I am. I've mm-hmm. never in my life. I, I read. We, we all know I, I don't read much fantasy, and the books that I do read are very, um, you know, y- you start and then there's like a very clear ending, and and I'm satisfied, and then then I'm done with it. I've never read a book more than once, maybe maybe Twilight. <laughs> Actually, yes, I did. I did read that one twice. I'm not gonna lie, but um, I just ne- I just never think to do that, and I never I didn't know that that was even an intention. Um, when writing. So that's actually really interesting to hear. Um, it, it's, it's what I like, uh, the books that I can go back and reread. Um, to me, they're the ones that, that uh, have the, I guess the most profound, uh, long-term effect on me. The other ones literally I can, and I read, I still read other ones that I know are going, you know, 
to the used to the box to go for the used book uh, store uh, as I mm-hmm. give away books. But then there are some I hold on to, and they're two different two different things. You know, as a reader, you you're just getting different things out of it. Uh, but the ones that stay with me, those are those are rare and very special. And so that was kind of what I was hoping to achieve with the Malazan stuff. Yeah. And um, I mean, for some people, it just doesn't happen. It doesn't work. So it, it's it's mm-hmm. always going to, I, I'm going to lose readers. It's as simple as that. It, there's no other way around it. It's just the way it is. Do you think that there are other authors that don't like I I I have I have no concept of this obviously um that write a book and they don't expect it to be read multiple times is that a thing is that a- uh jeez I've never asked I don't know <laughs> and neither have I I've never thought of this <laughs> I think for me, hmm. it's it's funny you say that this is something you look for in a book, Steve, because I think I've only come to appreciate that later because I think sometimes the first time I read a book, and I think I really had this effect with Told the Hounds in a way, I'm like so eager for the information and the story and like what's going to happen, you know, that sometimes what's going on on like a sentence level or a structural level or, you know, you know, th- these more nuanced things that sometimes I'm not always paying as close attention to them because I'm more focused on like what's going to happen on the next page. Yeah. Do you know what I mean, and I think then when you're I'm actually freed of the burden of knowing what's going to happen next, I can feel like I'm more liberated to think about, well, what's this paragraph doing? And maybe I should just reread this paragraph, you know, and just like kind of, I don't know, go at your own pace or I don't know. I, I it's a very different experience rereading something, knowing what it is, as yeah. opposed to encountering it for the first time. Oh yeah, it's a it, yeah, it's a very good point. I think that's a personality type too, though, <laughs> to to want to even read it again. Um, I've just yeah. I don't no, know. I'm with I'm with India. I can't even watch a movie twice. What did yeah. you just say to me? <laughs> I I've watched. There are like five movies that I've gone out of my way to watch more than once, basically. <laughs> Well, what about uh, Galaxy Quest? Oh, I've only watched that once all the way through. That's insane. <laughs> what is Galaxy you Quest? You haven't seen Galaxy Tim Quest? Allen. And you should watch Galaxy I've never, Quest. I've never even heard it's of it. It's one of the great you films. Like it. It's got Tim Allen's got Snape. It's a yeah. great film. Speaking of which, Steve, we just re- we we just read the second Willful Child book, and we had a <laughs> yeah. hoot, and, and we, we I think I actually had more fun with that book than the first one, so cool. and, yeah. uh, it was a good time. Well, you, since you had mentioned it, Steve, recently you did pen, uh, I would say, a long essay of uh, about characterization and how you rephrase oh go ahead sorry peter i'll interrupt in a second (laughs) you can jump in no i'll pick a better time to interrupt you keep going okay i'm gonna interrupt i just want to (laughs) say if you are not if you listen to this show and you are not following steven erickson on facebook you need to get it together because making a mistake every other day is either the most precious story about archaeology that almost makes me cry every time um, in between laughing at how often Steve was hungover, mm. uh, or it is it is Steve just spitting fire at people, and it's incredible. Yeah, yeah. So there's my plug. <laughs> I, I I agree. It's it's there's a lot of Steven Erickson content there. If that's the, I would yeah. If you're listening to the show, you probably already know. Yeah, I'm gonna guess. I feel like th- there's probably a big crossover on that Venn diagram. <laughs> But all I was going to ask is, um, what kind of spawned you writing that essay? And and, um, how often do you think you want to engage in responding to criticism in essays in essay form like that? Because in before you've posted a lot of essays on your website, and I actually really enjoy reading those essays. We I I, I find them quite well. I'll I'll answer this in a roundabout way. Surprise, surprise. Um... Steve Straight Shooter Erickson taking the long way? Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, somebody posted a link to me from a, uh, a YouTube blogger named Daniel Green. Mm. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, his blog, uh, which I just read this afternoon, was basically saying uh, Erickson's rant, he's right kind of thing. And basically opening the door to the notion that uh, authors, um, specifically writers, I guess, as opposed to artists in general, can or maybe should take advantage of the sheer uh, extent of openness of communication that exists online these days between fans, uh, reviewers, critics, and those who produce the works that are being criticized. And it was it was a, it was a very nice um, response on his part. And I, I was going down through some of the commentary. You know, dangerous thing to do, but and occasionally somebody would sort of say, "Yeah, he overstepped his bounds," et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think one reader said it's the kind of uh, essay that 
he should have written and sat down for a day and slept on it before going okay. back to it. And my response, I actually just responded to that on that uh, blog, uh, YouTube post. Hmm. I, I slept on that argument or in that statement for 20 fucking years. So, you know, right. overnight, right. sorry. <laughs> it's like, really? <laughs> so I, I, I did tone it down. Um, the only thing that sort of seemed to spark people was I expressed frustration and irritation in the framing of what I was going to talk about. Because what I talked about is simply uh, a, a, just another take on my essays on characterization. Uh, it's just my framing saying I, I'm kind of tired of you know people on um, Reddit saying I can't do character, um, mm -hmm. so I just got ticked. And you know, I, you know, everybody's human. I, got, I was in a snarly mood that day, so that's sort of how I framed it. Um, it comes yeah. through. <laughs> yeah, well, that's okay. I mean, <laughs> I'm often in a snarky mood. So yeah, I'm yeah. with you. <laughs> Can I ask an absolute left field question that popped in my head and I can't stop thinking about it? Please, bro. Go. How, what languages have you released the main series in? Well, me personally, none. Um, but the publishers. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. It must be 1920 of them, I guess, somewhere around there. How. As an author, how do you maintain like the integrity of like the written word that you like poured so much into and make sure that like as best as humanly possible, it like goes over? Is that you? Is that just like you trusting the publisher to find a good translator? Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, okay. I, I can't read those languages. So um, yeah, <clears throat> it's it's a crapshoot. There, there's no way. And occasionally, um, as what happened in France, there were at least two different translators or maybe one i can't remember who did not do a good enough job to sort of um or for whatever reason Damn. you know people said that was rubbish and, and that happened also in italy with first translations um Oof. and fortunately especially in france um it got picked up by a different publisher who was really serious about it and not only that he had set up he had gotten the first five books translated before he even released the first one and mm, so it's a called shot. Yeah, it was brilliant. And so he his plan was to release one every six months to catch up. Jeez. And uh, mm. and so that's why I did like a, a four week tour in France a couple of years ago. Um, a book mm. tour. Oh. So yeah, it's it's very much uh, hit and miss. There's you know, mm. um, we had a deal made with a Turkish publisher who took the money and ran. So uh. <laughs> these God. things happen. Yeah. So, Jeez. Cutthroat world of book translation. I have a question mm -hmm. about ha have you been? How many countries have you been to? And what's your favorite? I'm so curious because you Ugh. seem very well traveled. Um, wow. Well, let's see: Central America, um, uh, Britain, um, Scandinavia, uh, Germany, Poland, Serbia. That was a strange. Was it Croatia, Italy, Belize, Nicaragua, Guatemala? Mexico, Hong Kong, Beijing, um, Spain, Mongolia. That's it. Do you have a favorite? Do you love all of them for different reasons? Oh, yeah. Or are you yeah. Want <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, do you have a favorite? Well, I like the landscape of Mongolia because it's, it's very similar to the landscape of southern Saskatchewan in Canada. Uh, open uh, prairie, raw prairie, unbroken prairie. Uh, I love mm. that landscape. Um, mm. Parts of Sweden are very much like the White Shell Park in Manitoba in Canada. Yeah, places are like that. I mean, I I have a great time at all of them. Yeah, I, I'd imagine so. I'd imagine mm. so. Remember travel and going to other I countries. Know. <laughs> Tell me about what it. a time. Tell me about it. I really miss it. Oh, I was supposed what to be a in, what a different time. Supposed to be in Spain. I'd have been invited to Russia. Oh, I was oh. going to go back to France, which I, I love France. Absolutely adore France. Mm-hmm. What about it? I I hear only amazing things. I hear the it's the best food ever, but I'm a huge food person. I don't know. Um, it's probably different for you. But. Don't let them convince you to to order steak. They are the French are convinced they do great steak. They don't do great steak. <laughs> oh, <laughs> they don't do great steak. Fired. Everything Hot else, <laughs> awesome. I mean, yeah, uh, their wines uh, are are extraordinary. For a while really? there, I was a big fan of Spanish, or I mean, not Spanish, of Italian wines, and then Croatian wines. But that month I spent, or five weeks I spent in France, I've just fallen in love with French wine. It is 
<laughs> it is unbelievable. Um, and their crepe, of course, is great. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, they have a lot of really good food, but I don't know what they do to their steaks. It's just, it's the cut of meat. <laughs> I mean, I'm spoiled, right? You know, in North America, I, I, yeah. I'm getting Alberta grass-fed beef, and it's just, it. It's really good. Uh, my father was, before uh, he went back to university and school, uh, he was a chef. He was a master chef. And oh, so, really? Yeah, and so I, I, learned, I learned how to cook steak from him. Wow. And uh, wow. so I, I, I guess I have very high standards on that regard. You make a mean steak is what you're I saying. I make a mean dad. steak. Yeah. <laughs> is your dad's name Eric? No, but here's ah, a story. Here's really a hoping. story. It's unprovable. Have I told you this story about my father? No? No. Uh, I don't think okay. so. No. Please share. Yeah. In the late 60s in Winnipeg, um, my father was on a, uh, a local televised cooking show. And um, he came on at 1130 in the mornings. I think it was CKND TV or one of those in Winnipeg. And right after his show, okay, he was he was a bit of a ham. So he was, he was quite funny. Uh, but he also told extremely bad jokes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, so people liked his show because he was entertaining as hell and it was something we knew from home but he would trash the kitchen in the process of cooking it would just be <laughs> just stuff everywhere right because he's used to working and people wipe up after him and he doesn't bother um, <laughs> immediately after him was a, a kids show starting at noon called Archie and Friends and it was a ventriloquist uh, oh. who had um, uh, I guess mannequin puppet style, style thing called Archie they had a sock mm -hmm. puppet called um, Marvin the Mouse. <laughs> Where is this going? This sounds fascinating. Where, Where could this be going? This. Um, <laughs> and the thing is, all across Canada, there was a kind of um, a fraternity, um, but not in the, in the gender sense, of uh, ventriloquists and puppeteers. One of them in the 60s was visiting, very young guy, um, by the name of Jim Henson. And he got to see um, my father's cooking show. And my father had a very strong Swedish accent. He wore the white hat up top. No way. And he I had see where this mustache. is going. No way. And he had the mustache. Stop. And um, <laughs> my father has since told me that, you know, he didn't even bat an eye. He said, yeah, yeah, I'm the Swedish chef on the Muppets. Stop. <laughs> There's no way. It's, oh, right? it's unprovable, but Jim Henson did see my dad uh, on his cooking show. I'm going to the grave convinced that your Josh dad is. is the Swedish chef. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's such That's a good that story. story. Was going yeah. I don't know if it's true or not, but my dad certainly seemed to think so. And, oh. I believe it. Yeah. So. Yeah. It makes sense. You're the son of a Muppet. I feel like you have big Muppet energy. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Producer AJ here giving you a little break from what was an absolute whirlwind of a conversation with Steven Erickson. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the podcast. And of course, thank you so much to Steve for coming on and talking to us again about House of Chains. It truly was a wonderful time. As always, you can let us know your thoughts about this and all of our other episodes on Twitter at 10 Very Big Books or via email 10 Very Big Books at gmail.com. If you'd like to join the conversation over on our Discord, you can head on over to bit.ly slash VBB Discord and join everyone there. That's capital V, capital B, capital B, capital D Discord. That link will also be in the show notes. If you'd like to check out our Patreon, you can visit that link in the show notes or head on over to patreon.com slash 10 Very Big Books. At the time of recording, we are now at 141 patrons and $480 a month. That is insane. Thank you so much to anyone who has donated any amount. We are so beyond grateful. I will never stop saying that. Uh, and just a reminder that if you're waiting for your patron shout out, we will be, we will be doing them uh, once we start recording our Midnight Tides episodes next week. And as always... Thank you so very much to Dan Gesrick for making our spectacular logo. You can follow him on Twitter at Dan Gesrick for the hottest election email data mining takes. And of course, the wonderful music in today's episode is by the one and only Amaranthan from their album, The New Romantic, which you can find along with their other music on Bandcamp.com. Links to their pages will be in the show notes and 10 Very Big Books will be back next week on November 6th with our very first episode about Midnight Tides. That's right. We are on book five, baby. Uh, also a reminder for the U.S. listeners out there, Tuesday, November 3rd is election day. So please, if you can go out and vote. Anyway, let's get back to our conversation with Steven Erickson, and thank you so, so much for listening. You have a ton of interests. You, I, I, 
want to say you also said that you painted. Yeah, you were he painting at the start of quarantine. So when you go away, you said that you were just away for uh, for five weeks in in France. Well, not mm. just away, but you were there. Um, do you take time to like satisfy all of those interests while you when you go somewhere, or do you go for one reason and that's why you're there? Um, you pretty much go for the one reason. Um, we were traveling every day, um, most or most of the time, and. Uh, I was in a different bookstore in a different city in France, um, usually every mm. every night. Um, and mm. then when you finish your signing session, the bookstore owners, they have to take you out to dinner. Um, they insist. Mm. And you go out and drink lots of wine and have a great meal and great conversation. And then you go do it again the next day. And so it's, <laughs> it's, it's a pretty much, yeah. I, I mean, I was given nice sort of weekends off uh, just outside Marseille uh, with the publishers. Uh, publisher's house, uh, staying staying with his family, and that was great. It was a nice break, but um, mm -hmm. it was grueling, absolutely grueling. Yeah, sounds like a lot. I did. I, I actually wrote down as, do you speak a second language? Have you ever studied another language? No. And the weird thing is, um, my well, my parents emigrated from Sweden to Canada, and they made the rule that they weren't going to speak Swedish at all. I wish they had. I wish they'd spoken it huh. at home. Uh, we lived back there briefly when I was five, but only for a year. What I find is the more I hear Swedish, the more I understand it. It doesn't mean I can speak it. And mm -hmm. I was finding that in France as well. I was starting to actually follow conversations, even though I wasn't speaking it. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. I think that's common when parents, when, well, I guess they weren't parents at the time, or maybe they were when they came, but um, mm -hmm. I have a lot of friends who's who don't speak second languages because their parents refused to just because they needed to learn English. So yeah. 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 <laughs> Big regret. Um, <laughs> I want to loop back to like, I don't know, 15 minutes ago. Let's go. Uh, we were, when we were talking I, I about do got us. I got to say unconventional <laughs> okay. book, unconventional structure interviews. Yeah. Got an unconventional structure hey, there we go. all over the place. Baby. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, there's a method to the madness. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> In two um, interviews, you'll understand this one. Trust us. Uh, so I just when we were when you were talking about the the essay, uh, and you were talking about how people were upset at you for your feelings and stuff or whatever. Um, we had done an episode that'll come out. I think it just came out the a couple weeks before this episode will come out. A little out of our depth, but we were talking about the death of the author uh, and it's the role of in authorial intent, um, like in fiction everything um i assume you're familiar with the concept of death of the author death of the author um no explain it to me okay so it's it's basically just the idea that once an author writes a book that is where the author's influence ends pretty much and what the reader gets from the book is separate okay, yeah, from sure. what the author intended for the book so i was just curious where you kind of stood there you know if you think that the death of the author is a thing or sure. Um, or and that's why it's, it, it's incumbent on, on the author to be fully cognizant of the assumptions that they're pulling into their story. Um, right. And to be able to defend the choices they make uh, in their books. Um, and I have seen on occasion um, particular authors who are, who prove themselves actually unable to defend their positions. Hmm. Or they didn't think about the implications of what they were writing or, or they, they didn't think about the assumptions that they were making. And if somebody calls them out on it, then, you know, it's, it behooves the author to uh, acknowledge it and say, you know, mea culpa, I, I didn't think about that. And uh, I'll try to do better next time around. Um, mm -hmm. So, I, I, I mean, I'm very self-analytical when it comes to the writing. Uh, I want to make sure that what I put in there is is what I intended to put in there. And I try to avoid any sort of obvious assumptions um, that suggest a particular moral framework or, or an ethical framework. Um, I, I, I will explore those things, but I'll explore them through character. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, 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 out of the, it's out of the writer's hands to a certain extent. Right. Yeah. Um, so that kind of leads me to what was the... I guess talking about impetus of essays, what was the impetus of the, the Carsa essay? Was it just that it, it raised so much uh, of like a, a fervor, I guess, amongst the, the readers and stuff or, and, and you chose to wrote it or was it I don't something remember. that the, I don't the publisher, um, oh, okay. The Tor.com Tor was doing um, a read uh, with right. a lot of commentary 
and I may have penned it for that purpose, but I, I actually don't remember the full context of, of why I wrote it. Somebody may have asked me for it. I may have mm-hmm. actually talked about it in at the International Conference on the Fantastic and the Arts, and somebody said, well, put that, put that down on paper because that's interesting or whatever. <laughs> so, yeah. no, I don't remember. Sorry about that. No, that's fine. I, I, I'd assumed it was something along the lines of, of uh, the, the tour reread or, or something mm-hmm. to do with the publisher and something. So, I mean, it's a known thing that like you're, you use point of view in incredible ways and specifically like using it to not rob or deny the reader of information, but purposely pick the point of view so that they are just out of reach of something. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I, I read a, a really great mystery novel uh, last week. And while I was reading it, all I could think about was like, oh, oh, this like Steve, Steve just writes mysteries, but in fantasy, like in, in fantasy worlds, have you ever like, have you ever considered any of your books to like contain mystery elements or have you ever considered like just writing a mystery book? Because I'm going to tell you, um, you would fool me until the last word, I bet. Yeah, I was thinking writing, about writing Murder, She Wrote style mysteries. Uh, who mm-hmm. did and the character was going to be called um, Inspector Hugh McDonough. Oh, God. <laughs> that's, that's some Steve shit if I've ever heard of it. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe I will at some point. Um, but it was going to be to spoofing because uh, we watch mystery. God, a Steve mystery spoof. Yeah. We watch, we watch British mysteries all the time. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Oh, I just watched An Inspector Calls the other weekend. So good. Yeah. Well, well the style is... Um, yeah, you want to be cagey, and and you don't want to spell things out too obviously. Yeah, you ha- if you hold close to a point of view, uh, very closely, then you know a lot of what goes on around us uh, occurs in a fog. You know, we're not we're entirely mm-hmm. aware. You know, the what's be- going on behind the scenes at any one time. So it's not much different in in, in these novels. Yeah, characters proceed on what little information they have, and. Um, and then it's just a question of, oh, if we're going to give you sort of bits and details, um, you'll get them from multiple points of view, and then you can put it together or not, as the case may be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, this, th- th- this is yet to fit in anywhere in terms of tone of this interview, but Josh <laughs> Baker really is curious. So, like, because of, like, how old we are, when I started reading fantasy, like, Conan just wasn't a thing that I, like, I knew it existed, but it was movies to me. It wasn't until we were reading Carso Orlong, like your essay about it, and you were like going hard on swords and sorcery and Robert Howard. And I was like, I should read that, but I am so like, it is such a foreign part of fantasy to me. Like, is there like a, do you just start with the first one he wrote? Like how, if, how would you approach Conan? You know what I mean? Or, or swords and sorcery in general? Yeah, I'd start with Conan. Um, but the ones, the, the, the true Conan uh, stories, a lot of Howard's uh, other short stories were repurposed into Conan when Conan became very popular. Mm, I didn't know that. Um, and some of them are okay, but they're not, you know, they're not uh, the full Conan stories. Okay. And then from Conan, I'd probably I'd probably then look at uh, Fritz Leiber's Fafford and Grey Mouser uh, short mm. stories, primarily because they are slyly deconstructing uh, the Howard Conan stuff, and they're very clever. Oh my god, I would have never spelled that correctly in my life. <laughs> no. <laughs> and then for the third one, I, I would go for Carl Edward Wagner's Kane series. Um, some of the editing on that stuff's pretty rubbish, um, but the writing's fabulous. And um, the story and the world building, well, the character building of Kane is is really worthwhile. Um, hmm. And it's pretty dark. If anything, it's it's mm. darker and more grim dark than anything you know, you're reading. You know, these days that they call grim dark. Yeah, yeah, I gotcha. Yeah, Carl mm. Edward Wagner was way ahead of his time in that respect. I think what's interesting. interesting about Swords and Sorcery is that, like, although it contains a lot of the same elements of like high fantasy, it's like very different. It's like very much a separate thing, and it's it's kind of interesting that I think sometimes fantasy can be reduced down to like the idea of swords or monsters or these things in a very simplistic way, which it like is obviously more than that. But you know, I don't know. I just it's it's just such an interesting sub. I wouldn't even call it a subgenre. I would say it's a separate genre in and of itself. You know? Yeah, Cam's written a really interesting essay on that um he should publish it somewhere it's he's connecting the origins of sword and sorcery with pulp uh pulp fiction yeah pulp fiction 100%. so I... and so he's connecting it to oh. um, uh noir 
uh, writing styles. Uh, people like, like Chandler and Spillin and all the rest. Um, yeah, definitely. And, and mm. that is the connection. Whereas Tolkien, that's coming out of, um, you know, Once in Future King or, or Teacher yeah. White and, and that kind of thing. So, and the fairy tale and, and kind of genre, folklore in a sense. Yeah. But the pulp stuff is very urban. That's what it comes out of. And, and it's, it's a very different sensibility, and the film noir is is or and noir uh, pulp fiction has so many elements that it shares with sword and sorcery, uh, the horror element especially. And once you start reading Howard, you're going to find he he wrote a lot of horror stories as well. And hmm. quite often his his Conan stories are horror stories. They contain you know elements of both genres. It's really insightful. I'd like to read that essay. Yeah, I should ask him where he's got it floating around somewhere. Inge, what idea? on earth are you doing? I'm sorry. This, this is just not an ideal location. There was a centipede in the sink. We are fine. Sure. Oh. I'm sure we're fine. <laughs> well, what I was going to say was we talked about the bit of thaw thing a bit earlier. And obviously we talked about it a good deal in the show this this season. And I, I was curious because obviously these books and you don't really shy away from writing about sexual assault or these serious issues. And I'd be curious to hear you spoke about it from this colonialist mindset about this specific. But I guess wonder in general, what approach and what's your kind of philosophy when coming to depict such a serious subject matter? Well, it's a good question. Um, first of all, stylistically, uh, I pull right back and I become clinical and objective. Uh, in describing what's being what's being done, um, and that is to make a point that I'm not going to sort of uh, engage in any kind of uh, glorification of what you're seeing. It's it's, it's very repertorial in the style, so I, I simply lay it out um, without you know avoiding purple prose or whatever. Um, so that's the first thing I do stylistically, and the second thing I weigh very carefully what the point of view is going to be because that's crucial and. There are huge risks to be taken from almost any point of view you choose, whether you choose the victim um, or the perpetrator. And I've done both in my fiction uh, on occasion. And for each in each instance, I want to make a point of not shying away from staying with that character um, and exploring the legacy of their actions, whether they are a victim or, like I say, the perpetrator. Um, the Carcanus trilogy has as a, a character who participates kind of unwillingly in a, uh, a gang rape. And if I was just doing it for sort of shock value or, or even getting off on it or whatever, I mean, I would have left that character behind and just moved on to something else. But once the scene was written, I realized that I have to stay with this person. And this is a person who is self-aware enough to know that even as much as he may seek redemption, it is impossible. The act he committed is beyond redemption. Um, and that becomes a very interesting kind of character to explore. Um, not always pleasant, but it's it's the kind of character that's often not explored in, in fantasy fiction. You know, the true mindset of, the, of a person who, by circumstance, ended up committing a criminal act and then has to live with the consequences of it even as it slowly drives him mad. So point of view is, is, is very, very important. Um, and then the, the aftermath uh, can't just be, you know, shoved to one side or ignored. One has to explore it, I guess, uh, as, as clearly and as ruthlessly as possible. I don't know, when I, when I teach creative writing uh, classes, I often talk about writers having to be ruthless regarding their own self-belief system, um, their own... Uh, assumptions and to use their fiction to challenge those assumptions and uh, if at all possible to dismantle um, one's own belief systems. I know when I first started writing short stories here at University of Victoria, I was a wreck after each story because I instinctively dismantled my belief systems and it was traumatic. Each, each and every story was just a traumatic experience. Um, and yet I look back on that and realize just how important that was, that I allowed, I allowed my fiction to have uh, such efficacy over me that, that it could completely rebuild me or, or dismantle me. 
and so that's I I, I do push that in, in classes that that you cannot you cannot approach something as if you have all the answers as if you have any answers. Um, if you think you have them, then set them up in characters and then let your story, you know, tear those answers apart. <laughs> and that's, that's one of the reasons why I don't, I don't av- avoid those, those subjects. Um, it's too easy not to, you know, then, then you're kind of creating a romanticized version of that culture and that civilization and that fact is, that fantasy by extension, the entire fantasy world then becomes less realistic. Uh, there's less veracity to it. Mm. To be honest, from my perspective, when I read that, I I still remember the first time I ever even heard the word like, I, what a female mutilization, what female genital mutilation. Yeah, um, yeah, that I was I, I remember it like very vividly. I was reading a Seventeen magazine and they were talking about a small village in Africa that did it, and even I I think I was eleven and it oh, was sh- so yeah because you know you want to you want to be a big a big girl and read the cool magazines. Um, <laughs> So little did I know getting into that. And I, and I showed it to my friends and I was just so sh- like shocked. And then, and then, you know, you, you get over it because that's not my reality. Um, and you don't think about it again. And then to read it again, it was just like a shock to the system because it was just like this, this actually does happen. Mm-hmm. And it's crazy that I'm now reading about it in, in my, in my mental like break time. So I think for me personally, uh, it, it just kind of struck up a, a personal nerve that was just buried deep down that I hadn't mm. thought about for years. And then I read it and I was ch- t- t- horrified. Um, yeah. So that that's really, I think, which is interesting to have. I've, and again, I don't read books that really often elicit emotional responses. So it was interesting. And yeah, it was it was just surprising, I think. Mm-hmm. I just didn't, I didn't expect, I would have never expected it. I would have never, I, so that and, was, and, I think, yeah. And, and how did you feel when Carsa takes Bidithal and um, kills him in the manner I, that he did? I really, 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 really enjoyed Carsa's character. Um, I think, I think that might be different than a lot of people's opinions, but I, I love the, I, I the personality it was, it was just, I thought really enjoyable. Um, I don't read things, I think, on a level of like, oh, my God, he was such a horrible be- in the beginning and he did this and that. And it's, so for me, it's just I'm reading in the moment and I, I enjoy him and I enjoy what I'm reading. So um, that part, he, he and I also have a, qu- a follow up question after this. Mm-hmm. I, I was really <laughs> happy about it. I was like, yes, he's he, he said he was going to do it and he came and he, and he did it. So like now. We had a question in the in the mailbag episode. Do you guys care if I bring that up? Is that cool? Please go for Great. it. Um, about him setting people free of their chains by killing them. <laughs> but I had never thought about him. I thought he wanted to be set free of his own chains. But I never thought. I never put those associated that he had those intentions for other characters. Um, and this also kind of touches on the death of the author too, because I, I don't know if if it's about your interpretation of it or it was my interpretation of it, but can you tell me what your, if, if that is a true and accurate depiction of what, what he did when he came back and was like, okay, I said I was going to kill you, so now I'm going to kill you. And then I said I was going to kill you, so I'm going to kill you. And then, because for me, it was just like, he's, he has his own personal moral code where if, if he says he's going to do something he's going to do it and you deserve it. So he's going to do it. Yeah. I'm with you on that one. Um, yes. <laughs> Carsa, it takes a, a long time before we see Carsa um, display uh, acts of mercy. You saw one when he threw the bones of, um, I can't mm-hmm. remember who back into the water. Sibella. Yeah. Sibella. But again, that's very, again, ambivalent. You can read that any way you want. Um, it's hard to tell whether he's being merciful or, or just fed up. Indifferent, yeah. It, yeah, has had, has had enough of this conversation. Um, and I wanted to leave that up in the air because I knew later on he's going to um, deliver one gesture in the 10th book that is an act of mercy. Spoiler alert. And so <laughs> yeah, it, it's a long time in coming, but it's set up here in House of Chains. Um, no, I never I never imagined Carsa doing anything uh regarding freeing people from their chains. Um, but as a character, he would just look at a person and say, free yourself. Um, and if you can't, well, get out of my way. Um, right. So 
he he basically represents the Malazan world's force of nature when he arrives uh, in the camp, uh, having returned uh, from collecting his horse. And that force of nature says, this is all twisted beyond all recognition, and I'm shutting it all down now. And he does. Can I just say, someone that enjoys a good Western, <laughs> I... Ah, I, I loved that you were just like, and then he gets a horse. Yeah. And that's gonna be that's, that's gonna be a whole part of this book. Like the the confidence to just be like, I can make that interesting is astounding. Because <laughs> I was so invested. I, I does the horse have a name? I can't remember Havoc. the top of my head. Havoc. Come on. Havoc. Yeah, duh. After the other one. Yeah, God, it's so duh. good. Such a good horse. If you kill that horse, I will never forgive you. Mm. I won't need to know that. Oh my gosh. Let's not go there. Oh. Or we can go there. Peter, you look like... Inge, it's funny you say that. And we talked about... We we, we read the problem of Carso Orlong essay and we talk about it. And in that episode, I express... Uh, I personally don't enjoy the character that much. However, the three of you really do. And you guys talked about it enthusiastically. And it's funny you say that, Inge, that you didn't know if you were representative in liking Carso. But I feel like my impression, and I'd be curious what you think, Steve, is that he is a, a, a somewhat divisive character in that I think most people are either really enthusiastic about Carsa yeah. or they're more like me and they don't really, I don't know, they don't, get, they're not on board with the train. Mm -hmm. So I actually think it's kind of one or the other a lot of the times. And I mean, sometimes I read people's opinions that are like, oh, I could take it or leave it. But I feel like generally most people really like him. And then there's a vocal minority of people who are not on board. And that's my impression, yeah. Steve. I wonder what your yeah, experience and, and is. And it may, I'm just speculating here, but it may actually break down to the reader's belief system. Um, is a person capable of change or not? And if their answer is no, then they're going to hate Carsa for what he does uh, initially. And if their answer is yes, then they're going to they're going to give him the benefit of the doubt. I don't know if that's true or not, but I'll just throw it out there as a possibility. Uh, it's hard to know. I mean, Carsa is a, a very complex character, and the way I manage his point of view actually makes him more complex because I don't reveal too much. Um, right. Mm. In fact, I had more fun writing book one of House of Chains than I had in, in years, um, just by <laughs> just being a complete asshole and holding off on things and keeping the point of view so tight. Um, and I mean, the only reality you're getting out of that book one is coming from his two friends. It's not coming from Carson. Mm -hmm. I mean, he is so deluded yeah. at that <laughs> point. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, his his uh, entire uh, vision of, of how the world works is is twisted beyond belief and his two friends actually they see far clearer than he does yeah so when you made the choice to be like they're never going to see this one coming and start with you know several hundred pages or however many pages of carsa did you have any like examples to look at of they did it successfully or were you like i could probably do that uh you mean like how did you sticking to a single point of view or well, like in a book series that, or, in, you know, oh. so far, that's just not what we do, you know, yeah. and then to make the decision to just do it for that one. And I, you've hinted that that a, a very long single point of view happens later in the series. But for this one to have a book series, that's single point of view for a quarter of it. And then the rest of it is multiple POV. Was there anything you, was that reference for you no. or were you just kind of, you just fly by the seat of your pants? Yeah. Yeah. Fuck it. Yeah. <laughs> I just figured I wanted to write <laughs> it. it. I'll write it. Um, okay. If Fucking you guys, and this is a spoiler <laughs> because we haven't set this up yet because we talked about it before we recorded, but if you talk to Mark, talk to him about book one of House of Chains because that's the game I ran right up until the everything plays out uh, at Silver Lake at the community there. Yeah. Mm. Oh, I got to ask. Tor like, Torvald Nam is such a good character. Ha like... Please tell me we get to see him again. And if not, how can you make such a good character for such a short part of this book? I loved him. Yeah, no. Um, yes, you, not only do you get to see him again in the series you're reading, but I believe he's going to show up in the second Carson novel, the, the one I'm, that, that's go. coming up. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, which reminds me, it's probably worthwhile asking, you know, people love to hear. Um, what are you working on now and what's maybe the status of different projects? You know, I think people are always interested in that. <laughs> I'm working on Walk in Shadow, which is the third Carcanus uh, book. Yeah. Um, uh, just to go back to House of Chains, um, India, you mentioned you enjoyed the dialogue between Lostariel and Pearl. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I did. I thought they were so... Lostariel is like... I, 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 
I don't know why I gravitate toward the female characters. Um, there are great acoustics in this bathroom. There are. But um, <laughs> <laughs> can you come here every week? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I she is like sassy but confident and smart and capable, and I love I love everything that she says. And then Pearl is just. <laughs> hilarious i i just i can't there's no other <laughs> like he's very cunning but in a very funny way so when they talk to each other this i think they just are so different he's more light and she's very serious and i i just love i love them the back and forth the other two people that i don't like whose names i don't remember what are their names I think you're thinking of Troll and Onrak. Them, on the other <laughs> hand, Steve, I don't know what it is. I am. I try. I try so hard. I try so hard to relate, and every time I'm just like, oh my goodness. And then I found out that the next book is about Troll. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And is it? Is it? Is it? Is are they? I don't even know the question I'm trying to ask. I just found their <laughs> sections so not fun. It'll be interesting when you get to the Bone Hunters, uh, book seven, or is that book six? What does that even mean? Book seven? I, yeah, book book six. Uh, it's funny. I think although <laughs> Pearl and Lestara are in Dead House Gates, and you know they also have a journey there, I really feel like they come into their own more in this book. Well, yeah, and, and the reason why I brought it up was uh, the the interesting tidbit regarding those two characters is a lot of their dialogue and their interchange is snatches of conversations that i have with my wife and so and they're almost verbatim uh, 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 we've matched we've matched some of those conversations uh word for oh word my gosh so <laughs> and that, that's what that's me. what inspired me uh to when i built those two characters and ha and stuck them together i thought okay well, let's have some fun with this and um yeah oh my you gosh. took me from like an eight <laughs> to like a 12 <laughs> and 10 was the, the limit that is right that is incredible that's incredible is so she very is she more serious? She can be. Yeah, she's um yeah, let's say her 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 uh patience regarding my endless puns and jokes and all the rest, you know. Shenanigans. It's been getting progressively shorter as the years yeah. go by. Yeah. I I yeah. I can I'm like that too. I can relate. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Not to uh, you. I no, wouldn't no, no, I would I, I would I wouldn't know your puns. <laughs> <laughs> So I want to ask that obviously <clears throat> this book is the beginning of the adjunct Tavor story. It is. And I was wondering what considerations you took into starting kind of the arc of such a central character. And additionally, if you always knew she would be a queer character. Uh, to me, that aspect of her character is, is I guess, the least relevant uh, to her as yeah. a character. So I can't tell you when... I'm, whether I made that decision or just showed showed up organically, mm. I, I had very early on. I realized that even though we saw Tavor very briefly in Gardens of the Moon, she was going to be the primary driver of the entire series. Um, even though I couldn't get to her until book four, and we weren't going to see her at all in book five or in book eight. <laughs> but anyways, um, <laughs> and so she. I took all the lessons that I got from reader response to Anamander Rake by keeping him at a distance. He became a very quick favorite. Um, and so with Tavor, I pushed her even further away. She is going to continually frustrate you in her inscrutability um, right up until the last hundred pages of the series. So, um, and she's one of my favorite characters because of that. If you thought I was, you know, applying a lot of terseness and brevity to for listen uh wait to you know I, I deal with tavor she's one big question mark through the entire series and yeah. i really enjoyed writing that um yeah we spoke a bit about it on the uh, on this recent wrap-up show and i am actually very keen and i think we've talked about this before on rereading her storyline since i think i understand more of it now and i think the first time through as you alluded to uh <sighs> Yeah. That, that lack of information. It, it, yeah. Yeah. I think you understand. Yeah. Peter, was it you saying, you know, um, when Tabor uh, cuts down uh, Shaikh on the battlefield, um, why are you mm. holding your hand mm. up like that, India? Mm. You gutted me. Well, so, she was my um, favorite character and she just. Yeah. Okay. But think in terms of Lostera and Pearl understanding what has happened here. 
So, Peter, would you actually have walked up to Tavor and said, by the way, because I don't really like you, you actually just killed your sister? It's funny. We actually just recorded about this morning. And I feel like I was about to be know, very so we, vindicated. We had our finale episode and we all were like pretty harsh on Pearl and the Star and like, God, Pissed. Tavor, Pissed. Rah, 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 you know, and, except but, me. Yeah. OK, except AJ. <laughs> But I, okay. it's funny, all champion. three of us were in agreement that if I were in Pearl's shoes, never, ever would oh, I tell, no. you know, I, I just, I would never tell Tavor this, you know. No. So, uh, it, whilst it's easy to say that from afar, I, I personally would never have the, I would never make that decision, so. Yeah, no. I agree with you, yeah. An impossible decision to make, isn't it? Or Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> I know you can't tell me this, <laughs> but if she never finds out or what if she already knows? Either way, uh, what? I'm going to be so upset because, well, I don't know Tavor yet. Maybe I'll love her, but I, Felicin, <laughs> I, it, she just, she just needed a hug. That's all she needed. She needed a little love from her <laughs> sister. She did not have a goddess in her head. I was so, I, yeah. I was so upset. Oh my gosh. I was so well, upset. That, there, oh. there's, there will be one line coming from Tavor in the 10th book that should put it all in place. So. Thank you so, oh much. I appreciate you so much for that. I honestly, because I, I just don't, I have no, I don't, I don't have any words for it. I was so angry. And honestly, if I was Pearl, I might've just been like, don't freak out. <laughs> don't freak out. <laughs> don't freak out. <laughs> Why? Did you just stay with me here. You've shown no, you've shown no emotion this whole time. So this should be no different. You just killed oh your God. sister. And then I, and that's that. And because how does she get off just doing that? <laughs> How does she get off just doing that? I mean, I would say she's probably not in long term, not gonna. But well, there's, yeah. there's one line in the 10th book and, and Steve, I'm holding you to it. And I will yep. reference this moment <laughs> yep. when we get there. Yep. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about it again at that point. Yeah, yeah. let's we'll see. Well, I mean, we'll revisit it. Well, maybe we should start moving towards wrapping up. That sound mm -hmm. good, Steve? Yeah. I'm just having um, so much fun, though. <laughs> do we have any uh, good closing questions from any of my co-hosts? Uh, oh. Josh has one about a specific type of television. No. <laughs> I don't want to ask that question. No, no. <laughs> All right, fine. Uh, well, I mean, well, Steve, you've listened to the to the episode, so you know that Josh said... Uh, the, the, at least that one storyline is extremely. I do say anime. that a lot of oh, a lot oh, of what you write uh, sounds yes. Hold like on anime. A sec. Hold on a sec. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! Oh god! Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what is all this anime rubbish? So look, I mean, so, <laughs> so, look, so look, so look. I watch a lot of anime because I enjoy it. And I'm leaving. No, what I'm no, no. Say what is I'm that... saying is, you guys were talking about. Oh, Steve must watch anime because of I can't remember for whatever. It was. I never said that, Steve. Steve, yeah, I never said that. It's just me. It's just me. I, I, can, just I, can, me. I, can, I mean, I, I talked to my son about this, and he just laughed because he tried getting me to watch. This is many years ago, Gundam Seed, and okay. after about mm. uh, ten okay. minutes, I'd lost the will to live, and I have never watched <laughs> any because I hate the animation style. I despise. Well, okay, uh, it infantilizes people, especially girls, women. I just I can't oh, yeah. stand it. No, yeah, I can't stand it. So it does. Yeah. yeah, for somebody, I, I can't remember who, which one of you was, but it's you, me. Yeah, called out. Oh, this is this is so on, and this is inspired <laughs> by, I don't know, some anime thing. <laughs> no, sorry, not the case. Okay. Who's here first? Debunked. Steve is not. Steve does not watch anime. Steve is not a weeb. Right. It's been resolved. Steve is not a weeb. <laughs> I guess not. I have to find out what weeb meant. Yeah, what's a so weeb? You know what? We're good. I have to ask my Just... son about that one. He <laughs> That's funny. That's so good. All right. Um, <laughs> any other closing thoughts now that we got that the most pressing <laughs> issue off the table? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I guess because because we're going into Midnight Tides. Um, I know we're expecting a lot of Trull, uh, a lot more of, of that backstory and stuff. But for you, did you know that five was going to be all about Trull? Or was that yep. like a situation where you started writing it and then went, mm, I should probably write a book before this? No, no, I knew. Um and it was going to be two tales of, of three brothers. Um, is oh, so, so. there's a lot of brothers in the book. It's a lot of brothers. Very cool. Book. I'm down. I have a brother. I'm down for brothers. I have a brother. <laughs> Sorry, India. Because House of Chains was about sisters. And this one's about brothers. Oh, damn. Uh, <laughs> this Memories of Ice you... was about mothers. Ugh. When you talk, oh my it's God. just all the pieces. <laughs> you just like place puzzle pieces. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh. Ugh. Um, yeah, Dead House Case is about friendship. Mm. Mm. I, and Gardens of the Moon. 
Um, it is. <laughs> it's about cousins. It's a very cousin heavy <laughs> book. I think it's I mean, more big about, uncle it's energy. about comrades, I think, more than anything else uh, in, mm -hmm. in the soldierly fashion. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But that one, I, I always put that one apart from the others in the sense that it's a primer uh, for the world. Yeah, sure. mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there is eight years between it and Dead House Gates. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, Mid uh, Midnight Tides definitely, definitely brothers. Well, we're Very looking nice. forward to starting our read through of Midnight Tides and looking forward to talking to you again at the end of it hopefully and we appreciate you coming on to answer our fun. various questions it and our fun. various respond to some various qualms you know it was a little little hot episode in here we got all over <laughs> the place it was amazing and i'm so happy <laughs> i agree i had a blast actually it was cool. it was a hoot cool. holler and good time so thanks for coming on and mm -hmm. uh goodbye steve goodbye everybody mm -hmm.